Hello and welcome to the Days of Yore. Today we'll be speaking about the 1937 General Strike, a labor action uh, that began here in Nelson in, with the uh, Farmer Labor Union that had been founded in January of that year uh, and saw 2,000 individuals uh, leave their work uh, and, and in the hopes of gaining better wages and better working conditions. So my sources today come from the local newspapers for the most part, as well as a book on New Brunswick's uh, labor advocacy, history of labor advocacy. So uh, let's begin. So we'll begin then by speaking a little bit about the Farmer Labor Union. So you will recall uh, a few weeks ago, uh, actually maybe quite a few weeks ago now, who, uh, back in the spring I believe, uh, we did an episode on John Wallace. Uh, again, a, uh, a real champion for the working man as it was conceived uh, in those days, and also a poet, uh, and a man who's going to appear a couple of times uh, in this in this piece. So uh, again, the the um, the the kind of work that he was doing through the New Brunswick Federation of Labor and the International uh, Labor Association had really kind of struck a chord here in in Nelson, but. Uh, there was a sense by January of 1937 that perhaps uh, that sort of that those those institutions maybe were not representing the interests of mill workers and longshoremen uh, and others uh, the way as well as perhaps they could have. And so the, at the labor hall in on January the 13th, a new kind of union was formed. This is a farmer labor union, it was called. The New Brunswick eventually became the New Brunswick Farmer Labor Union. Um, this was, was somewhat was somewhat of a change in that it was no it was not a union that represented a certain kind of workers, but really kind of had a had really kind of a general multi-occupational uh, outlook. Community-based and also worked uh, with both full-time and part-time workers. Uh, there was a sense at this time that the the drift of labor advocacy and the attention of uh, unions in the province was very much focused in kind of that the the southern part of the province, and that this was sort of ignoring in the issues of places like Miramichi. The president and of the the union was uh, a small business owner, er, Greg McKern, and, uh, and a, who had been a, a supporter of the credit union here in the community, or I guess would be he, uh, as well going forward because it would be the next year the Bowbury Credit Union was formed. The secretary was Frank Dolan, who was very much involved loved in farming and agricultural work. He was on the Dairymen's Association and I think at this time was running a model farm in Nallenville. So again, and, uh, again, community individuals was, uh, representing in a lot of different workers at this time. They were, they were very open uh, and directed their advocacy not necessarily to employers only, but to the general public at large, with statements along the lines of it was time for government uh, of the people and for the people, rather than government and of the privileged few for the privileged few. And again, John Wallace was one of the early speakers uh, at this meeting uh, and would follow the union, although he was not a member, uh, and there he, though his affiliation was more with the New Brunswick uh, the New Brunswick Labor Association, and um, he was again a, a, a follower of the actions of the Farmer Labor Union. So, the throughout the throughout the spring and summer, more chapters of the Farmer Labor Union began to spring up, and the demands again uh, were beginning to beginning to, to reach kind of a, a higher pitch as spring turned to summer 
and summer began to wear on toward the, the end of August. Now, uh, the, the, the provincial government had recently set up kind of a fair wage board to kind of look into industrial disputes. Uh, Premier Dysart was somebody who at this time had campaigned and won the 1935 election on, on the promise of getting your Brunswick back to work and off of, uh, you know, social uh, social, social uh, security and support uh, programs, and again, that instead of kind of receiving money, everybody could be earning money, all of that sort of thing. So his government had kind of set up this fair wage board, and certain grievances here in the community had been brought uh, to that board, but there was a feeling that uh, well, that, that no, no action had been taken, and that while they were still kind of deliberating and ruling on this, uh, the, the attitude in the community here was that this board was just sort of inactive and maybe was not willing to kind of take uh, the actions necessary. And so on August 19th, 800 members of the Farmer Labor Union uh, voted to strike and gave 24 hours for their demands to be met. Now, this was in the face of some pretty uh, questionable, uh, and certainly today we would say reprehensible, uh, labor practices at this time. Uh, one, union, or one mill in particular was paying uh, their employees 17 and a half cents an hour. The men were working 10 hour days, and the, uh, the owners had indicated that they were not willing uh, to discuss any kind of change at any point in the future. So, uh, basically, the Farmer Labor Union uh, presented their terms and gave, gave uh, the, the milling operations uh, across, the, across the, uh, the region 24 hours to accept them. And these demands were recognition for the Farmer Labor Union so that this could be a negotiating body and a body that could, uh, you know, that was, that, that was legitimate for workers to join. A 20, 28 cents an hour minimum wage, uh, now that doesn't sound like a lot because it isn't a lot. Uh, even with inflation, that's $4.93 an hour. So that's, that's still very low today. We, we know that just recently the province has announced that in 2022, uh, the, the minimum wage in this province is going to go up two dollars, a dollar in April and a dollar in October. Uh, so again, I mean, these guys are just saying, you know, we want we want guys to be able to make you know twenty eight cents an hour when they start. Uh, you know, really, only what uh, only ten and a half cents more than than kind of what what is setting this off. Uh, a mill that's only a mill that's only paying their men 17 and a half cents. So they're only really asking for 10 and a half cents more, or at a minimum. Uh, so, so again, let me take that as you will. Uh, so 28 cents an hour minimum wage, one and a half times. Uh, so time and a half basically when it's overtime. Aim 50 cents an hour when uh, you're loading the pulp boats. It's 50 cents an hour when you're loading long lumber. Or, uh, from the outside of the ship into the ship, and 65 cents an hour if you're on the inside of the ship loading that long lumber. Uh, now, again, to be fair, Greg McCarran, the president of the Farmer Labor Union, is willing to say that the Fraser Mill and the Birchill Mill have indicated and have since the 1st of May, he, at this time, been working closely with the union to try to meet them halfway. So he's not saying that, you know, all the mill owners are you know, all bad people and, you know, whatever. He does acknowledge that there are allies out there or in the sawmill and industrial communities. Uh, but he's called, you know, again, the, the meeting is saying that it's not enough that two mills out of all the mills in the, uh, you know, along the river, or it's, it's, it's not sufficient. And they're going to give 24 hours. And they've also called for the resignation of the four MLAs uh, representing Northumberland County, uh, those being uh, William S. Anderson, Richard J. Gill, Frederick Tweedy, he, and uh, Hidulf Savoy. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, so, and again, all, all, well, two out of the three of these guys, these uh, Anderson and Gill are both 
uh, mill operators. There's uh, Tweedy, also an industrialist. Savoy, a you know merchant. So you know, there's the sense that maybe these guys are not actually acting in the best interest of working men. So anyway, um, by the 20th of August, uh, no action has been made, and Greg, pardon me, Greg McCarn goes from mill to mill. Uh, and as he reaches every mill, well, he calls the men off the job, and the men follow. So this has to be a very evocative image. You know, this, this man who actually is carrying the Union Jack, is carrying the British flag as he goes, uh, you know, which is kind of an odd image, certainly to me, you know, because when I think, you know, uh, Unionism. I guess I'm not really thinking the British, the British, the British flag of the British Empire. However, what he's probably doing is he's trying to say this is this is nothing to do with uh, trying to distance itself from socialism, communism, that sort of idea, and really kind of presenting it as you know, we're loyal citizens. We're not loyal, you know, we're not loyal to the common turn, and we're not doing this for some great, you know, communist worldwide revolution. We're doing this because we, we want what's fair. Uh, we're still we're still people that you know are very uh, passionate about our identity as Canadians, uh, but again you know are not willing to kind of lay down and allow ourselves to be trampled by industrial interests. So by the end of that first day, he, uh, a thousand workers are off are off the job, about twelve different uh, mill operations along a forty mile stretch of the river. Uh, Within a matter of days, that number has gone up to at least 2,000 people. Um, and the Premier at this time basically says that, you know, we were, we were right on the cusp. We were going to be able to do something very soon. Uh, and it's a really a shame that they didn't wait until that Fair Wage Board uh, had, had come down and kind of made their decision. The Canada Cement Company goes out, uh, the workers there, her, uh, go and leave their job in sympathy with the mill workers in the area. Uh, the, there are seven steamers uh, in the community who cannot load at this time. Uh, they're sitting there, they're waiting for it to, to be loaded and to take uh, lumber to other ports, but they can't be loaded because again all the longshoremen and are on strike and they're very sensitive to the fact that if uh, non-union labor uh, loads them up, they know that when they get to port uh, in other places, uh, whether it be you know in New York or Boston and, or you know overseas, there's union men there that are going to say, "Listen, if union men didn't put this on here, on this boat, we're not taking it off. We're not going to support that kind of behavior." So they're they're refusing in uh, non-union. Uh, longshoremen or non-union labor to load their boats and they're saying we're going to sit here until eventually he you know somebody comes that that's able to load this up uh, and do it in such a way that we can get offloaded as well that's a little bit circuit that's a little bit uh, convoluted there but i hope like i made that come across and i hope that it's clear then that this is more pressure or that are that's on uh these mill operations so uh, there is an attack on, on some non-union workers who are trying to load salt at the Logie Wharf, but other than that, things are pretty orderly. He, uh, there's a lot of mass meetings, there's a lot of big gatherings, things, uh, and there's a sense, again, in parades as well. So the union is really kind of trying to show its strength in the community and show they're not going to go anywhere. Johnny Wallace is very vocal in saying in that, you know, this, the union has to hold out in order to get uh, you know those fair wages and see that their demands are met. However, there are a lot of people that question the timing of this. This is toward uh, again. This is the end of August. We're going into uh, you know a fall, maybe a winter. Who knows how long this is going to be going on? And there's a sense that maybe this was not well timed. Um, However, there is also a lot of sympathy in the community, and a lot of the newspapers are saying that, you know, this is going to happen at some point, and, and now it is, and now we really have to deal with it. Um, the only mills that are not uh, affected by this strike are the Canada, or the Miramichi Lumber Company mills at Morrison Cove in Douglastown and the Gill Mill in Barnaby. Uh, by, by about the first week, uh, 
wages in excess of $25,000 have been lost. And so there's a sense that maybe there's a, there's a lot of pressure now on the workers too, who they're losing money. It might not be the amount of money that they want to make, but they're not getting any money now. Oh, and so there's a sense that there's a sense that maybe there's pressure kind of kind of mounting on both sides. John Wallace again steps back into the breach and he says, you know, at the first of this year, the provincial government raised the stumpage rates, raised the money that they're going to make off of, uh, off of every cut log here in the province. And, you know, Wallace felt certain that they did this, this you know, after some consultation, after a sense that they, you know, that the market would be able to support that. And, you know, he says that the bosses won't pay up you know, the government should put a rebate back on that stumpage fee and use that money to pay these workers what they're owed. I mean, it's, it's again, I mean, the, 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 the arguments are coming back and forth. Ten days after this, this whole thing starts, uh, at the end of the month of August, a settlement is finally reached, mediated not by the government, but uh, by the mayors of... Uh, Newcastle and Chatham, as well as the heads of both boards of trade. He'd, and, you know, the, the, the settlement terms run remarkably in the union's favor. They get their 28 cents and, uh, an hour as a minimum wage, a nine hour work day, 32 cents an hour for boom, for men working on the booms, and, uh, 40 cents an hour to work the block and the flower boats. It's 50 cents an hour loading long lumber on the outside, 60 cents if you're working inside the boat. Which, uh, and while there's no formal recognition and of the New Brunswick Farmer Labor Union, it's clear er, that, uh, that their methods have been effective in this case, and the New Brunswick Federation of Labor er, does invite them to their meetings in 1938. By the years of the First World War, er, a lot of those unions are getting recognized here along the river. Uh, their ultimate, their ultimate uh, fate doesn't see them much, much past the 1940s, but again, they had done a lot of work. And so that's, that's a very long story, but I think we'll leave it there. Uh, the general strike of 1937, uh, again, that was kind of catalyzed here in Nelson that year by the Farmer Labor Union. Uh, a really interesting and probably not a well understood and not a well, uh, well enough known episode here in Miramichi and New Brunswick's labor history. So, uh, if you're enjoying this content, if you're enjoying these videos, do please like them, leave a comment and on them if you feel so inclined or if you have any requests or, or desire for further information. Please subscribe to the channel, it helps us out quite a bit. Uh, if you're interested in more options and uh, again, more exclusive videos, have a look at the patron options uh, in the description box below. Uh, again, almost uh, now, I guess, what, almost nine months of series available uh, for you, and you can start right away, and that's a lot of it, a lot of videos to watch, uh, really, for as little as, as $10 a month. And $10 gets you access to all of that right now. So, uh, with all that, uh, again, we'll be back again next week uh, with uh, some little bit of holiday cheer from Nelson up from 105 years ago. So I look forward to seeing you then, and I appreciate the time that you've spent with me here today uh, on this topic. And uh, for the days of yore, I've been Dr. Sean McCarthy. Thanks so much.